Section 6, Monopoly. Here are the characteristics of a monopoly market. The most significant characteristic is given right here. We have a single seller of a highly differentiated product. It is important to understand that a monopoly can be created in several ways. One obvious way in which a monopoly can be created is if a firm has a patent or a copyright for a particular product and other firms are then not allowed to enter the market for a certain period. Another situation is where a firm has control over some critical resources. At some point in the past, De Beers had control over almost all the mining operations in South Africa and it was close to being a monopoly and it was close to being a monopoly. The most common reason for a monopoly to exist is government authorization. A classic example would be that in a large city, a particular entity is the only organization authorized to provide electricity. Fourth possible reason is strong brand loyalty which creates high barriers to entry and a classic example would be Rolex where people who buy Rolex watches believe that they have something different and special and there is nothing else that compares with or competes with Rolex in the eyes of Rolex customers. And finally a network effect. Here, a classic example would be the Microsoft Windows operating system or Microsoft Word, where as the penetration of a particular product increases, it becomes harder and harder for another product or a competing product to enter the market. You will hear this term natural monopoly. I'm going to describe it briefly here and then we'll see it in more detail later. A natural monopoly is one where the cost decreases with quantity. So if we look at the average total cost, that keeps coming down as additional quantity is produced. Now, a natural monopoly will be meeting most of the consumer demand at a relatively low cost and it would be inefficient or extremely difficult for new players to enter the market and compete with this natural monopoly. Demand analysis in monopoly markets. As you can imagine, the demand curve in a monopoly is downward sloping. So if you look at price and quantity, this is the demand curve. Sometimes students ask why the demand curve for a monopoly is downward sloping given that there is no other product. Think of it this way. If you consume electricity, and let's say that there is just one provider of electricity, then your consumption would still be dependent on price. If electricity is provided to you at a very low cost, i.e. low price, then your demand would be relatively high. If electricity is extremely expensive, then your demand for electricity would be relatively low. So even though there is just one company providing electricity, your demand still depends on price. So this is the demand curve. Let's say that the demand curve is represented by this equation. We can rewrite the equation with price being the subject of the formula. And if we rewrite the demand equation this way, then we can see that the intercept is 800. And we can see that the quantity over here will be 400. Now, what does the total revenue curve look like? If this is price, notice that total revenue is going to be price times quantity. Price is this. So we then have 800 minus 2Q, all this multiplied by Q, and total revenue becomes 800Q minus 2q squared. Marginal revenue, as we've seen before, is the change in total revenue over change in quantity. This is the first differential of the total revenue equation. When you come up with 
change in total revenue over change in quantity, 800Q becomes 800. So remember with basic differentiation, this is Q to the power of 1. You subtract 1 from here. So you have Q to the power of 0, which is 1. And the 1 actually comes over here. So you have 800 minus 4Q. The 2 comes here and is multiplied by the coefficient. So we have 4. And then from the exponent, we subtract 1. And we have Q. In case you are confused, you need to learn your basic calculus or your basic differentiation and i'll share a separate video in which that is explained or you can watch some maths calculus videos on the internet so anyway this is your marginal revenue curve 800 minus 4q and that is this curve over here as we've seen several times the marginal revenue curve is downward sloping and it is steeper than the demand curve the average revenue is simply equal to total revenue divided by quantity. We have shown that this is the total revenue. If you divide this by Q, what you will have is 800 minus 2Q. And this is the same as what we have over here. So the average revenue for a monopoly is the same as the demand curve. Supply analysis in monopoly markets. The profit maximizing level of output is when marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. So going back to uh, demand, marginal revenue and marginal cost, we have a dollar figure on the y-axis. So this is the demand curve. This is marginal revenue. This is the marginal cost curve. And this is quantity. The profit maximizing quantity would be the point where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. So this is the profit maximizing quantity. And the price would be based on the demand curve. So at that quantity, consumers are willing to pay this price. Therefore, a monopoly would like to set this price because this is the price that would maximize profits. The total cost function, let's say, is given right here. This is a function that is given in the curriculum. If you get something like this on the exam, you will not have to derive a total cost curve. It will be given to you. The marginal cost is given by 50 plus 6Q. 2000 20,000 is a constant, so that disappears. 50Q, again, as we've done before, this is Q to the power of 1. 1 comes over here, and you subtract 1 from 1. The 50 comes down. And then 3Q squared, when you find the first differential, then you have 6Q. So marginal cost is 50 plus 6Q. All we've done here is demonstrated how to come up with the marginal cost curve given the total cost function. Optimal price and output in monopoly markets. As we've just seen, the optimal output is when marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. This is also the point where the change in profit over change in quantity is equal to zero. And to understand this intuitively, let's look at a profit versus quantity graph. Say the profit rises to a certain level and then starts coming down. Notice that where the profit is maximum, the change in profit over change in quantity at this point or in this region is equal to zero. If you are given the equation for profit, and let's say this is given to you, then what you can do is the following. The change in profit divided by change in quantity is given by 750 minus 10Q. Again, we are taking the first differential here. We set this equal to zero because the change in profit over change in quantity is zero over here. And from this, you can easily determine 
that Q is equal to 75. So this is another way of coming up with the profit maximizing quantity if your profit function is given. Something else that you can learn over here, here is an expression for marginal revenue. Marginal revenue is equal to price multiplied by 1 minus 1 over E. E stands for the own price elasticity of demand. Don't worry about the derivation of this formula. Just remember the fact that marginal revenue is equal to price times 1 minus 1 over E. I did not mention this in my video lecture earlier, but the curriculum does point this out in the segment on perfect competition. So you need to know this relationship. And there's also a question at the end in the practice problems where this relationship is needed. If you remember this, then hopefully by now it has been drilled into you that the profit maximization condition is marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. This applies across the board and I think I have said this at least 40 times in this lecture already. Now, given that this holds true when we are maximizing our profit and given this holds true, then we can say that marginal cost is equal to price into 1 minus 1 over E. This holds true when we are maximizing our profit. And then if we are given the marginal cost and we know the elasticity, then we can find the profit maximizing price. So we can simply say that the profit maximizing price is equal to marginal cost divided by 1 minus 1 over E. And that is what is given right here. Profit maximizing price is equal to marginal cost divided by 1 minus 1 over E. If you are given the marginal cost 75 and you are given the own price elasticity of demand, then the profit maximizing price is simply equal to 75 divided by 1 minus 1 over 1.5 and this is equal to 225. So that will be our profit maximizing price. The only thing really new over here is this relationship and you need to memorize it. Natural monopoly in a regulated pricing environment. I've mentioned this before and I'll say it again now. A natural monopoly is one where the average cost of production falls over the relevant range of customer demand. So if this is our average cost curve, or this is the average cost curve for the monopoly, notice that this is constantly falling. If we have a situation like this, it is efficient to have one company which meets consumer demand, as opposed to having two or three or four companies where the cost or average cost of each company then would be much higher. So with a natural monopoly, what might happen is the government might authorize that monopoly. For example, it is efficient for one company to produce electricity for a given region. So given that it is more cost effective for one company to produce electricity for a region, the government might authorize that company to be the only company that provides electricity and then regulate that particular company. If the company were left unregulated, then the monopoly will maximize profits by producing the quantity for which marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. And we've seen that before. If this is the marginal cost curve, this is marginal revenue, this is demand, then the company would produce at this quantity and charge a very high price. Again, this is the dollar figure, either, either price or cost. This is quantity. So this would be the price given or this would be the price if the monopoly is left unregulated. This would be the quantity if the monopoly is not regulated. But in a situation like this, a government will regulate because the government and consumers do not like the fact that the price would be this high. 
or the quantity is this low. In terms of regulation, there are two broad strategies. One is to regulate such that price is set equal to average cost. If price is equal to average total cost, then this gives the monopoly an opportunity to earn a normal profit. In other words, if the price is set over here, then the economic profit will be zero. And if you recall from earlier readings, when the economic profit is zero, that means that the monopoly will be earning a normal profit. Another scenario is to set price equal to marginal cost. And this is the price that would be in effect if we had a perfectly competitive market. If price is set here, then we have a bit of an issue because the monopoly then will face an economic loss because at this price, the average cost is actually higher than the price. So there will be a substantial amount or potentially substantial amount of economic loss and the government would have to then subsidize the monopoly. But nevertheless, recognize the fact that these are two broad strategies for regulating a natural monopoly. Price discrimination and consumer surplus. The basic idea here is that the monopolist might try to charge different prices in order to extract as much of the consumer surplus as possible. Let's look at a few different ways in which a monopolist might do price discrimination. First degree price discrimination is where the consumer is charged the maximum he is willing to pay. In this scenario, there is no consumer surplus. The idea here is that if the monopolist can figure out that for the first item that a consumer will purchase, he is willing to pay 100 for the second item, let's say the consumer is willing to pay 90. For the third, he is willing to pay 80. If the monopolist can charge 100 for the first item, 90 for the second item, 80 for the third item, and so on, then the consumer does not have any surplus. So the consumer surplus is zero, and this entire consumer surplus is taken up by the monopoly. This would be first degree price discrimination. Second degree price discrimination is where the consumer is charged differently based on how much he values the product. A simple example that many people listening to this video can relate to is the example of a Texas Instruments BA2 plus calculator. There is a professional version and a regular version. The professional version has a few more features, but the cost of producing and distributing the professional version is only marginally more than the basic version, but the cost is much more. There are still people who buy the professional version, though I doubt that they use all the features and functionality offered by the professional version. By having this separate professional version, Texas Instruments is able to draw a little bit out of this consumer surplus from the people who value the calculator more than others. This is a simple example of second degree price discrimination. The key point to remember is this point charging differently based on how much consumers value the product. Those who value the product more will be charged more. Third degree price discrimination is where consumers are segregated based on demographics or some other traits. For example, airlines have figured out that business travelers are willing to pay more than leisure travelers. So business travelers are charged more relative to leisure travelers. Or if you might take regression software or econometrics software, student packages will cost less 
relative to professional packages and student packages then will have data processing abilities which are limited relative to professional packages. These would be examples of third degree price discrimination. Now let's take a look at this example which illustrates how a given firm, in this case my local gym, can take advantage of price discrimination to try and extract as much consumer surplus as possible. So try to do this first and then we will go over the solution together. Here is what you need to do and a lot of this material should be material that you've seen before. This is the demand function. So we have Q is equal to 25 minus 5P. We can invert this and get P is equal to 5 minus 1 over 5Q. The graph looks like this. When quantity is 0, price is 5 and the X axis intercept when price is 0, then Q is equal to or the quantity is 25. The quantity represents the number of visits that I make to the gym. So this is the demand curve. If the gym charged a price equal to marginal cost, which is 1, how many visits would I make per month? So if the price is 1, then the number of visits would be 20. And we can see that over here. If I put 1 instead of P, 25 minus 5 is 20. That's the second part. Third part, what is my surplus at this price? The consumer surplus is this area over here, which is half into base, which is 20, into height, which is 4. And the consumer surplus then is 40. How much could the club or the gym charge per month for a membership fee? This is referring to what's called a two-part tariff. What the gym could do is charge a monthly fee of 40 and then one per visit. This way the gym can extract the entire consumer surplus. And you can also practice this concept by doing example 3, which is essentially the same question with different numbers. The key point to remember is that when companies engage in a two-part tariff, they set a membership fee or a monthly fee that is equal to the consumer surplus, and then they charge a per visit fee equal to the marginal cost. Now try this example. Here is the correct answer C and you can read the explanation. This is what you might see on the exam where generally the CFA Institute is not going to drill you on the details but expects you to know the basic concepts. What are the factors which impact long run equilibrium in monopoly markets? Unregulated monopolies can earn economic profits in the long run, and we have seen that. For regulated monopolies, there are several possible solutions. One is that the regulator sets price equal to marginal cost. We have also seen a situation where the price is set equal to average cost. There can be national ownership, so effectively the government entity can take over the monopoly. The third scenario is where there is a government entity which regulates the authorized monopoly. So the electricity producing company in a given city might be a private entity, but it would be regulated by a government entity. And in many countries, this is a popular solution. And a final strategy is that governments franchise monopolistic firm through a bidding war. In other words, let's take a situation where only one company has the right to transport passengers to and from the airport. So in a sense, that's a monopoly, but that 
contract or right is given to a company based on a bidding war. Now I want you to do example 4 from the curriculum.